Hello everybody, thanks for having me, I appreciate it. So today we're gonna to focus on musculoskeletal health and chronic kidney disease. I'm trying to gear it more towards um, students, so I didn't try to get bogged down too much in a lot of mechanistic data. I'm gonna give sort of the highlights for different studies. Just kind of focus on some of the basic science that I've done so far leading up to trying to optimize exercise interventions. So I've done studies from cell culture through animal model, clinical studies, as well as now through most recently doing community engaged work with those with chronic kidney disease, as long as the grant gets funded. Otherwise, I may have to get that culture part out. Um, and so we're gonna talk about that. Um, when you look at the overview, you know, uh, I feel like, um, I don't know how to position, because I have to be right in the middle, right? Is that okay, I can be off to the side? Okay, because I want to be able to look and then not get in everybody's way. All right, perfect. So I want you to appreciate that in CKD, musculoskeletal health is impaired, it's a problem. So we'll go through a couple slides just to first appreciate that, give everyone a good uh, base knowledge. We'll talk about exercise efficacy. So obviously everyone in this room, hopefully, we're committed to exercise, we think it's a priority. Um, just not sort of, giving too much information away. The exercise effects haven't been as robust as I really hoped for, so it's been a little bit deflating, but at the same time, opportunity to think in novel ways. And then we'll talk about it more from a uh, community-engaged standpoint. The bulk of the talk will be more about basic translational science, and then at the end, we'll kind of get into some implementation stuff and some of the community-engaged work. I, people put this at the end, but I like to put it in the front. These are all the different people for the data that's in this talk of people that I work with, and it really can't get done with one single person. So I always like to put it up front to really thank all the people that I work with. Um, I just, it, it, this campus is really great. Uh, more often than not, I really haven't had anyone say no. Uh, most people are really friendly, engaging, open, and so it's a really great environment if you are interested in research. I've heard of other places that are maybe not as much. So it's a good thing on our campus. So as Steve said, I went to University of Illinois, IU, U of I, Pittsburgh, and came back here. And so when you look through the different course of research that I've done, uh, when I was at Illinois, I did more um, affective responses to exercise, so more in that psychosocial domain. When I came here during my DPT, I was doing more basic science, looking at bone healing and rodent models with Dr. Warden at Iowa. I was doing um, digital human modeling. So that is a digital human that's put into a virtual environment and it predicts how people would move. So it's used for ergonomics, the military wanted it, and we were putting human uh, capabilities into a digital human. So we were sort of adding that sort of real life aspect to a virtual environment. Then I went to the McGowan Institute for Regenerative Medicine at Pittsburgh, and that's where I got more of my basic science training. So up until Pittsburgh, like outside of a couple classes in undergrad, I really never picked up a pipette before. And so, you know, as you're thinking about your career, it's not as if you can't always pick up a new skill or it's not too late. And then I came here during another postdoc at IU, and that's where I really started to get solidified into musculoskeletal health and chronic kidney disease. So the hard thing as you're thinking about your career, if I don't know if anybody's interested in research or if you're just kind of suffering through this for the extra credit, but if you're interested in research, you can kind of see how I go from one area to the next to the next. And sometimes it feels like you're kind of finding your way in the dark. You don't have this one narrow focus. And so sometimes you can feel lost. You can feel like, gosh, I don't know what I'm doing with my career. And those are all the normal things that I had. And so as I've been here, I'm kind of pulling some of these things together in ways that I really hadn't planned. But you get to speak a lot of different languages because the engineers at Iowa thought very differently than those with psychosocial at Illinois. So you kind of get multiple perspectives, multiple languages. So I feel like I'm a pretty good translator in science because of all of those things. Um, so my, my, my research spans from looking at basic science, translational science. For today, I'm really focusing on the initial basic science. Any of the clinical studies I'm really not presenting here today, just don't have time. From a translation to practice standpoint, I do a lot with developing evidence-based guidelines and clinical practice guidelines specifically and trying to get those out to clinicians. Um, and then now most recently trying to do more community-engaged work. So from a basic science standpoint, I'm trying to figure out how to optimize exercise prescription for those with CKD to really benefit their musculoskeletal health. At the back end, from the cultural or community-engaged perspective, it's now trying to figure out once we get the optimized dose, 
how do you get people to do it? Because people with chronic kidney disease don't want to exercise. And so uh, we're trying to figure out at that end, what are some cultural perspectives, individual perspectives beyond just traditional barriers research that we can try to figure out to help people become more active. I also put, you know, I, I know how it is, Friday afternoon, I don't know if you ate or not yet, so I figure at points you may be blacking out and you'll come back to me. So I put a little uh, picture of a rodent when we're talking about basic science. I put a picture of a person if we're talking about the T1, the glasses for clinical impl implementation, and then the multiple people who are community engaged. I also have pictures of muscle, if we're talking about muscle, if we're talking about bone. So hopefully whenever you come back to me, you'll be able to look at that slide and say, all right, I know what's going on. So when we look at chronic kidney disease, we have different stages of disease progression, okay? Stage one and two, Typically, we're not gonna be able to identify, or if you do, it's because they had a, an acute response, they're in the ER, they're in the hospital, but most people aren't recognizing that they have stage one kidney disease or stage two. It's not recognizable or diagnosed until you're more symptomatic, so you're in that stage three, four, or five. For stage three, um, your GFR is right about 30 to 60, for stage four, we're in that 15 to 30, and then less than 30, you're either going in for transplant or you're gonna start dialysis. So it's a clinical progression of disease. The global prevalence is up there, just so you can appreciate it, but over 30 million Americans have chronic kidney disease, and it's the 10, 10th leading cause of death. So it is significant from a mortality perspective. It's also significant from a disability perspective, and we'll talk about that. When you look at some of the health-related problems, heart disease, high blood pressure, early mortality, bone disease, we have muscle loss and weakness, I think. Fatigue, headaches, so when you start looking at this laundry list of things that people experience with chronic kidney disease, exercise can help with a lot of these things. Um, you know, when I got into the, the TMJ from a clinical perspective, almost every person that comes in with uh, TMJ issues has a headache. And exercise has been one of the really um, evidence-based uh, methods to intervene with headaches. And so there's other things that you can do, but getting those people physically active can also help with that. So when you look at this list, it's almost like what exercise can't help with, right? So there's a lot of promise. It's just now we're trying to hone in on what we can do or how we can get it done. When you look at CKD, it impacts multiple tissues, multiple organs. Um, it can impact the CNS, bone, um, uh, the reproductive system, immune system, muscle, as well as heart. And so there's a lot of effects that it can have. So it's not just the kidney that is having these types of effects. It is a systemic disease. One known condition is called CKD MBD, so CKD mineral bone disease. And there are three different types of abnormalities. Uh, laboratory or known as biochemistry. You can have abnormalities in bone and then vascular calcification. So when you look at the different types of biochemistries, calcium, phosphorus, parathyroid hormone, FGF23, and vitamin D, those are all commonly dysregulated in CKD. You have abnormal bone turnover and mineralization. That then affects bone size and bone strength. And vascular calcification um, can occur as well. So all of these things are a known condition as CKD MBD. It's beyond just sort of a coin term. It does have significant consequence. So you can see before when we spoke about GFR, that 30 to 59, 60 range, that's where you really start to see this increase in PTH, FGF23, you see a reduction in vitamin D. You really don't have this phosphorus increase until end stage, but all these things really start to take a turn once you hit that stage three. And that's why a lot of folks in the stage one and two don't recognize that they have it. Um, and so when you look at FGF23, when that increases, that leads to uh, ventricular hypertrophy. Then you have PTH, that increases, that leads to frac weakened bone, which then can lead to fracture. Increase in phosphorus, loss of kidney function and vascular calcification. There are feedback loops that then enhance both uh, ventricular hypertrophy and kidney function. So all of these are increasing the number of cardiovascular events and mortality. When we look at mortality, all-cause mortality, cardiovascular mortality, hospitalizations, they all increase as you have a reducing kidney function. So as that GFR goes down, you're now at greater risk for uh, cardiovascular events, hospitalization, you're getting sicker at this point. A different way of looking at it, so the teal are gonna be general population, 
Those in the red are gonna be on dialysis. And regardless of age, it really doesn't matter. Cardiovascular mortality is gonna be higher in those folks that are on dialysis regardless of age, regardless of sex, regardless of color, okay? We spoke about the weakened bone. You also have some changes in the muscle. You have some fatigue, uh, sometimes confusion, cognitive changes, all of those things also increase fall risk. So when you include fall risk with weakened bone, you now have a higher incidence of fracture. The general population is in the, the black bar at the bottom, and so they're the lowest regardless of age group, but it gets consistently higher as you go through the disease progression from three uh, to four and then on hemodialysis. And then anytime, particularly when you get a hip fracture, that really has significant effects in your ability to return home, return to prior level of function, and really kind of get out of any kind of um, subacute type uh, facilities. All right, so we spoke about the CKD MBD. That's generally accepted. That occurs, people know it does. Um, I would say from a muscle standpoint, there's a little less agreement when we talk about sarcopenia versus frailty versus cachexia. And so some people think about these terms as components that have some overlapping entities but are distinctly different. Um, some will think about it as a stage of progression. As you go from sarcopenia to frailty to cachexia, you're increasing your vulnerability or your ability to adapt to an adverse response. In CKD, uh, I mean, I'm gonna talk about this. So sarcopenia is the loss of strength and function as well as the loss of muscle mass. Not really clear if the atrophy part is happening in CKD. We're pretty clear that function is being impaired, not so clear on whether or not atrophy is. So they may have a condition that is more dynopenia versus sarcopenia. So dynopenia is only the impairment of function without that loss of muscle mass. Or they may have um, the uh, constructs of frailty. Cachexia is typically not as seen as much in CKD. They don't have the extreme that you would see with cancer cachexia. So when we look at different causes, um, it's kind of hard to see small lettering, but from kidney disease, you have uh, uremia. So all of a sudden, you're not, your kidneys aren't filtering the way they should. So you start to have these buildup of toxic, toxic metabolites. You have metabolic acidosis, inflammation, oxidative stress, hyperparathyroidism. All of these are potentially leading to sarcopenia with impaired muscle function as well as atrophy. So when you look at some of the causes for muscle dysfunction, Mitochondria are affected. You may have reduced fiber type. Some studies have shown there's a specific reduction in type two fibers versus type one. The muscle quality may be more fibrous. They have more fibrosis in there, so a lower quality. Um, but then also um, a more intramuscular fat. All of these things are reducing power, strength, endurance, so they're having functional consequences. Are you all okay? Yeah, can you see? I feel like I'm standing right, okay, you're good? Okay, sorry if I'm standing in your way. Um, and so then from a atrophy standpoint, I mean, there's a whole host of different pathways that potentially can affect it. When I first got into this area, there wasn't as, as much as there, there is today, but it's still kind of overwhelming because there's so many different pathways that could potentially cause this. It's sort of hard to know what to key in on because chronic kidney disease is so variable. Like one patient can present so differently from the next. So I think some of these consequences for atrophy are also kind of hard to study. So when you look at function, this was a study that uh, was led by Dr. Morthy, but I've worked with her for a number of years. She's a great person on campus. Again, another uh, great collaborator. Um, when you look at this study here, risk factors of impaired mobility in patients new to dialysis, what I really want to take home is the level of impaired function. Okay, so if you look at this, uh, for people that are new dialysis, incident dialysis is typically like 90 to 120 days. So in that first three to four months, people are new to dialysis. Um, the average age was 55. And what I wanna draw attention to is this median gait speed right here of 0.78 meters per second. So this is for somebody that is 55 years old for our average number for uh, the, the cohort as well as for gait speed. That is equivalent if you look at age-related norms of somebody who's 80. So they're having significant impaired function. When you look at some of the thresholds for gait speed, typically when you're above 1.0 meters per second, that's indicating that you're gonna be able to achieve the things that you want to in life. You're typically gonna be independent with ADLs. 
you're more likely to be able to handle or respond appropriately to an adverse event. Once you get below this point eight here, now you're in this limited community ambulation. You're more likely to have your activity levels go down. All of a sudden you're not leaving the house as much. Maybe now it goes from that point eight to point six. And this is a really significant threshold because now you're more likely to be independent with ADLs and IADLs, as well as more likely to be hospitalized. So um, ADLs, activities of daily living, and then instrument, uh, instrumental activities of daily living for IADLs. So those are things that they're gonna be more dependent. So the gate speed is not just you know, a number, it's really indicative of how they're thriving and how they're functioning in life overall. So I'm gonna talk about a couple of studies in the, in the animal studies. Uh, basically I was very frustrated because one of the first studies that we did, we found muscle atrophy occurring in our animal model. And then every study thereafter, we haven't been able to reproduce it. When I would go and read clinical studies, one study would say there's atrophy, one study would say there's not atrophy. So um, Ashley Troutman, she actually did her bachelor's and master's, uh, probably with some, with some of you, many of you, right? She did it uh, here in this program. She then did her DPT over in our uh, program, and she's our first dual degree student. So she's getting her PhD right after her DPT, and so she should be done um, in a year from now. And so she's been very instrumental in getting a lot of these projects done. This is one that we uh, did together. She spearheaded it. We had, so because of the lack of consensus and muscle atrophy, we wanted to do a meta-analysis. So we looked through, I can't remember, like 6,000 studies. We narrowed it down. It was roughly over 110. I think the real number was 112 studies that were included in this meta-analysis. And we wanted to be able to look between preclinical and clinical. And so that's why it's so large, because we wanted to get an idea of what type of atrophy is occurring. Um, and so when we just look overall from a clinical study standpoint, the effect size here in this forest plot is right about 0.5. It's slightly under at 0.48. So from an effect size standpoint, it's considered or categorized as small. Um, when you look at whether it's the overall clinical or teased out by stages or ESRD without dialysis, really anything, it's either 0.5 or less. Overall, the magnitude effect or the magnitude of atrophy occurring in those with CKD from clinical studies is considered small at best. The ESKD alone was considered moderate because it was 0.55. So we're not seeing huge amounts of atrophy across all the studies that we did. When you look here in this one, uh, the preclinical, these are preclinical models, and then we teased it out by ad adenine and 5,6 nephrectomy. So these two combined made this one. You can see the effect size of 1.0. So these are large effect sizes. So there's large effect sizes occurring in animal models that you can control better, but there are small effect sizes in clinical studies that you really aren't controlling as well. So um, I think atrophy is, slight, is, is present, but its importance is minimized by some of the effects that we see here. It's in review for a really long time. That's why we have so many W's because we're almost coming up on, this is 10 months. So it's been brutal. Um, so hopefully it gets accepted soon and it all pays off. All right, so we know we have CKD, MBD. We may have sarcopenia. And so we wanna make sure that we have an animal model that reflects that. The CY model that I use um, does that a, a very nice job. Uh, Dr. Gatone, Vince Gatone, first found this model. Um, he was a faculty member in the School of Medicine who passed away a few years ago. Um, I hear great things about him. I had him as a student, seemed like a terrific person. And so very thankful for the, uh, the work that he did. And this model is a genetic, uh, it's a missense mutation. It's a genetic mistake in a particular gene that causes progressive kidney disease. The thing that we like about this model is that it progresses over time. So it takes about 10 weeks to go from stage three to end stage renal disease. And so we can be able to look at how interventions can be captured from stage three to four versus four to five. And the fact that it's not a surgical model, it's not diet induced, uh, we find beneficial uh, use of. The thing is that it's variable, much like we see clinically. So like I said, this is a study that we published back in 2016. We saw that muscle atrophy occurred across multiple fiber types from, two, from 1 to 2A to 2X to 2B. We also see this is electrically stimulated torque, so the animal's paw is up on a force plate. We electrically stimulate the anterior compartment, and we're looking at dorsiflexion strength. You can see at that stage four time point, that's where we start to get a reduction in force, 
and then that continues or progresses throughout end-stage renal disease. Also, as I have data up, I'm only going to focus on certain things, try to better direct you versus get too lost into the details. So when I first came into the lab, I, you know, obviously I wanted to do an exercise study. I was working with Jason Organ at the time, who's in the School of Medicine. Um, and so uh, we started doing this exercise training. It was uh, five days a week for 10 weeks, 60 minutes per day. So when you look at 60 minutes per day, five days per week, we're at 300 minutes. When you look at the ACSM guidelines, we're at sort of, if you're looking at a drug dosing study, we're going for maximum dose, right? We're looking at the high end. They were progressively increased. This is a pretty common protocol to use in animal studies, starting out at eight meters per minute, going up one meter per minute per week, so that at the end of the study, they're at 18 meters per minute. We, uh, this was a small study that we did, so we're only, I'm only presenting data right now from the CKD control and the CKD treadmill. So again, these animals ran for 10 weeks. Um, from this study, we found no effect on muscle strength. So it didn't impact electrically stimulated torque. It didn't impact serum biochemistry, so it didn't make the disease worse, but it didn't make it better. Protein turnover, no effect, but we did see greater uh, muscle catabolism through greater ubiquitin expression, as well as greater atrogen expression. Um, so from this study, we actually showed, an, um, not presenting it here, but a greater oxidative stress as well. So there are negative effects that happen from this progressive treadmill training program um, with very little, there's no beneficial effects to report. So it didn't improve muscle function. We weren't able to get cross-sectional area in this study. It didn't change any of the CKD, MBD. So for the first exercise study, it was a little bit deflating, but we kind of moved on, right? So one thing to consider is we're talking about disease progression, and so we are progressing the intensity of the exercise as people are getting sicker. So that didn't seem like a very good idea. So we wanted to move on to now um, looking at a physical activity model. So voluntary wheel running, we're not forcing the animals to run at all. They can get on there, they can use it 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, in this study, we had uh, both normal wheel and CKD wheel but honestly, there was no difference between these two groups. I think the stimulus just wasn't sufficient for the normal animals. And so we didn't have any difference between normal and normal wheel. Um, I put a lot of data here. I'm just gonna walk you through everything, give you the highlights. So when we look at CKD MBD, we have all of the biochemistries here. We have bone abnormalities here. Um, when we look at, so there was a few, a number of drug studies that happened in this lab before I joined. None of the drug studies did anything for CKD, MBD. They never looked into sarcopenia. It wasn't their area. Bone was more of the area. No drug was able to change any of the outcomes. Voluntary wheel running actually normalized a number of the serum biochemistries or significantly reduced it. So the CKD wheel guys are right here compared to the normals. So we can see for creatinine and phosphorus, both sort of markers of disease progression were down. We look at PTH and FGF23, some of those hormones that were regulating uh, hypertrophy, uh, ventricular hypertrophy, as well as bone health, they are also down. This was a 40% uh, reduction in FGF23 that wasn't significant, but I think the 40% reduction, even though it's not statistically significant, still could have a, an impact on, um, on bone health or uh, um, uh, ventricular hypertrophy. From a bone perspective, cortical porosity was uh, virtually normalized for the wheel running animals. And then there's a few other uh, bone volume as well as thickness and separation. So voluntary wheel running had beneficial effects. It improved CKD, MBD, it improved uh, that through some of the uh, biochemistries. When we look at it from a, a function standpoint, there was a 25% reduction in the animal's time to max. So this is where the animals are running. They just keep going until they can't anymore. It was reduced with disease and improved with physical activity or the wheel running. Whenever you're doing a study, sometimes the resources don't allow what you really want to do. And so this was an instance where I was doing other things related to mitochondrial assays and I couldn't do the electrically stimulated torque. So we wound up doing grip strength. It's, I don't like it. It was terrible. So in this study and the other study, we have, I'm presenting that data. I don't like the grip strength. We just did it. It was our only measure that we had resources for. Um, it, you know, the wheel running improved grip strength, but there was no disease reduction in grip strength. And so it wasn't mirroring what we see in the electrically stimulated torque. So in the grip strength, that's voluntary. In the electrical stimulated torque, it's not. We also found an activity wheel running. So we, they can run longer in the max test, 
They have stronger bones, some of the abnormalities for biochemistry are better. What was interesting is, this is looking at mitochondrial complexes from the soleus. It was reduced, complex one, which is sort of the gatekeeper there in the respiratory chain. Um, it was reduced in disease and consistently reduced in the activity wheel. So you would think from a physical activity standpoint, those should increase. Um, and actually, I, I, during one of the papers I got, one of the reviewers thought this data was being faked. And I'm like, what? It's it. it is what it is, I don't know. Um, so we have this uh, reduction in mitochondrial complex one. It wasn't worsened with wheel running activity, but these chains were reduced in two, three, and four. The same pattern happened in the extensor digitorum longus. So whether it was slow twitch muscle or fast twitch, the reduction happened in both, okay? Now it might be hard to appreciate here, but this, these are EM images of uh, the mitochondria. It's really normal looking very nice in these animals. Uh, when you get to the CKD, we had qualitatively less mitochondria in the CKD. The numbers, there was no difference between CKD and CKD wheel, but when you blow these images up and you look at the mitochondria, the wheel running animals, it was really engorged and damaged. Um, so we were wondering if maybe, even though we see some beneficial effect, is it coming out of cost? We don't really know. We did uh, metabolomics in these animals as well. And so we're looking at uh, the soleus, the EDL, and then the EDL again. When you look at comparisons, normal versus CKD, normal versus CKD wheel, and CKD versus CKD wheel. So I'm just gonna focus on this one for now, CKD versus CKD wheel. Anything on the left-hand side, this is a negative. This is talking about the fold change, so the magnitude change. It's saying that the CKD wheel was lower than CKD without the wheel. The size of the circle is talking about the significance, the p-value, okay? So when we first saw this data, um, we focused in on C0 because that is carnitine. And carnitine has an important aspect in CKD. So when we first saw that, that was the piece of data we, we really kind of glammed onto. So carnitine deficiency is common in those with CKD. Some people will attribute it to dialysis, but when you look at urinalysis studies, um, the output of carnitine is the same for a healthy person who is urinating normally, as well as someone with CKD going through dialysis. So it's not the dialysis pulling the carnitine out. What happens is you have a reduction in biosynthesis for carnitine. Um, it's primarily made in the kidney, also the brain and liver, but with a kidney damage, that reduction goes down. Also, there's a reduction oftentimes in protein intake, and so now you have a change in diet. Your main sort of food source for carnitine is red meat, unless you're chugging Red Bulls like it's water, okay? So when you look at carnitine, carnitine is uh, allowing that shuttle for long chain fatty acids to go through the outer mitochondrial membrane and then be used for beta oxidation. There are clinical studies that show when you have a carnitine reduction, you have impaired strength clinically, you have impaired function clinically. A study that was done in 2016, they blocked the synthesis of carnitine, so that's how they created their carnitine deficiency, and they had a reduction in running distance, muscle size, as well as mitochondrial complexes two and four. So they're showing a physical um, function impact from that reduction in carnitine alone from the, the kidney disease. So we did a study here where the problem list was, one is a carnitine deficiency, and then pulling from the wheel activity study, um, what's the appropriate intensity? So for the first thing for carnitine, we did a dosing study. We looked at two different doses that were commonly published. The 500 really resulted in super physiologic levels, so we stuck to the 250 because it essentially normalized carnitine. And so for this study, we have CKD control, we have CKD with carnitine supplementation and CKD with an individualized exercise protocol that I'm gonna talk about in a couple slides. So all these interventions that I'm doing are for 10 weeks. So again, we're going from stage three to end stage renal disease. So for the uh, carnitine supplementation, they had daily injections of carnitine at 250 milligrams per kilogram. Um, they, again, this was from uh, mid state, early to mid stage, all the way through end stage renal disease. The injections were given intraperitoneally. And then from the individualized training program, so we had the activity wheel, that lower intensity activity seemed to have beneficial effects. Um, the very intense treadmill protocol didn't seem to have beneficial effects. 
And so what we wanted to try to do was use the animal's behavior to indicate whether or not we should increase or decrease the speed. Um, this was something that uh, wasn't done before. And so when you do a study like this, you kind of have to accept that it may not work. Some people, when they see this, they really love it because it's a translational aspect. Other people hate it because you can't control the actual speeds and now how do you look at dose. But we have all the different doses um, for each animal. But to be honest, they were pretty similar. So what we would do is we would identify if the animal had the final five minutes in the anterior one third of the treadmill for their, uh, at the end of the session, that's an indicator to go up a speed if they did it two days in a row. If they were staying towards um, uh, the middle third here, if they're staying in the middle of the belt, that's a reason to maintain speed. Anytime they're going backwards or they're touching the coils, that's a reason to reduce. So we let the animal's behavior dictate. And so we thought maybe as disease progression worsened that they would start to slow down and we can use their physiological response to indicate the dose. Um, in general, the animals still ran pretty darn well. And so I think they didn't know how to control themselves because some of our running speeds were similar to the initial um, high intensity, maybe you wanna call it that, the 18 meters per minute. They were running pretty darn close. Um, one, one animal was running even way higher than that. Um, but nonetheless, when we're looking at carnitine and treadmill, the individualized treadmill program, from an abnormality standpoint, it's the bar all the way to the right. It had no effect on any of the serum biochemistry. So we didn't re reproduce any of the beneficial effects we found with wheel. We didn't have any effect on vascular calcification nor bone. Really the only thing to speak of is that the carnitine injections, which have been used clinically as a supplement in those with CKD, actually worsen disease progression. From a cross-sectional area standpoint, we didn't see any difference. So again, I don't know how much atrophy is occurring, but it's not occurring in our model. Um, again, this was grip strength that we had in this study, no difference in grip strength, but again, I don't like grip strength. This was more of a consequence of resources more than what I wanted. But it, the treadmill training did increase maximal running capacity. So it almost seems like regardless of what you do, whether it's low intensity, high intensity activity, whatever it may be, um, we are getting an increase in running capacity. So 10 weeks of carnitine injections worsened CKD MBD through increases in serum biochemistry. It did decrease cortical thickness, but it was only one outcome amongst multiple bone parameters, and it increased oxidative stress. Um, from a our individualized treadmill training protocol, it improved maximal running capacity, but it didn't make things worse, so that was good. We didn't have increased muscle catabolism or breakdown. Um, so now, what, the latest study that we did that's in preparation, the manuscript is in preparation. Uh, we wanted to compare the physical activity wheel to treadmill, but we did was we matched the volume. So the animals were typically running about 600 meters per day. And so we made sure that they ran 600 meters within that 40 minute period to kind of get a, a match for volume. Uh, this, the, the, the 13 meters per minute is kind of like, you're in the mall, you feel like maybe you have to start going to the bathroom. Uh, and so you gotta start walking a little bit quicker than just strolling around, right? So we're not, we're not running for a sale or anything like that, but you're not casually strolling. Um, and so we wanted to compare these two types of interventions to try to see if there was something special about the wheel that induced those changes in bone, or if it was maybe more of an intensity dependent thing. Like I said, in this model, a lot of things are variable. We couldn't reproduce anything that we had previously found for the physical activity wheel, nothing. It didn't help with serum biochemistries, it didn't help with bone, it didn't help with vascular calcification. They ran the same distance, similar speed, so we can't figure out why one cohort of animals, they, we, we were super excited and now nothing. Um, what I will say is though that this treadmill protocol of uh, kind of quick mall walking did restore electrically stimulated force. So again, that's the same anterior compartment looking at dorsiflexion. When you look at um, fatigue, this is the normal, this is uh, wheel running. Um, CKD and then CKD treadmill, um, you know, we, they had a, um, no, for some reason this color got messed up here because the treadmill and the wheel actually made an impact on muscle fatigue. So this color got changed. 
this should be the wheel running. Wheel running didn't impact muscle fatigue. So this is looking at repeated stimulations, 50 muscle contractions, and it's looking at the difference between your initial and your end. That's what this is showing. And treadmill actually improved the muscle's fatigability while wheel running didn't have an impact. So the treadmill improved muscle strength. It also improved muscle fatigue. I know as you're sitting there, some people are starting to think, well, how come you not doing resistance training? The resistance training models in rodents is fairly finicky. Um, often not really translatable, and so that's why we're kind of sticking to aerobic exercise right now. So when you look at some of the challenges between the spectrum of physical activity and exercise, we have some beneficial effects in voluntary wheel running, but we're not able to reproduce them. Individualized treadmill running had marginal effects of just increasing running capacity, but didn't worsen disease, and that progressive treadmill training protocol did have some negative or detrimental effects. So what we did was we went back to some of the metabolomics data and we now focused on if carnitine wasn't the answer, what else is going on? And you can see from this area here where we're looking at some of the longer chain acyl carnitines, they're consistently reduced in CKD because they're to the left. And so the question is, is there something going on with some of the long chain fatty acids? And if the long chain fatty acids are needed for exercise, is that really the limiting factor? So we did some PET imaging with palmitate, which is a very standard long chain fatty acid um, tracer that's used. We also did um, a, a FDG for glucose. There was no difference in glucose for the normal and CKD animals. But what you can see is fatty acid uptake was significantly reduced in CKD animals compared to normal. And this is in the lower limb as well as in the paraspinals, which was drastically reduced. And then when you look at fatty acid esterification, that process of making the triglycerides, that was down in the lower limb for CKD as well as in the paraspinals. So this is just looking at a normal CT with the overlay of the PET imaging. And then we also did a different technique here where you excise the muscle and then you assess it specifically within that, that singular muscle. Same thing down in CKD um, for EDL and soleus. And so what's happening, this is now the, my R01 that's being reviewed in October. Uh, five days, four days, I don't know, something like that. That's, so hopefully everyone's slept well, we got good meals, and the reviewers are in a good mood. So we're looking at optimizing um, exercise and pharmacological interventions to restore musculoskeletal health and chronic kidney disease. I'm working with Mike Schulte, who does the PET imaging, as well as he's making the drug that I'm gonna talk about in a couple of slides. So the thought is, if we try to address this carnitine shuttle impairment, we really didn't have beneficial effects, what else could be going on? We think there's a long chain fatty acid impairment. We have some other data to support that, but I'm not showing it here. So from an exercise standpoint, how can we use exercise to potentially overcome this impairment? The biggest thing is that high intensity interval training can bypass the use of long chain fatty acids because there's a preferential use for medium chain fatty acids. So if we have that long chain deficit, maybe this exercise um, approach will be able to overcome that. It also increases CPT1 and CPT2, which are uh, um, enabling that process for the beta oxidation going through the mitochondrial membranes. It can bypass mitochondrial complex one, which we've shown is reduced in CKD, and it increases oxidative phosphorylation. There's been a few studies that show this is feasible from both a clinical population as well as an animal. So we think from a theoretical standpoint, we don't have data to support this in our animal model, but we think we have enough exercise data to support this as a feasible specific aim. The other thing that we did was we're looking for an exercise mimetic to overcome some of the deficits. Um, this group, Ono, did a uh, sequential drug screening for over 296 compounds. Of the 296, this compound 17B did a really nice job of increasing muscle and bone. So they did this in healthy animals, they also did this in cell culture, and they also did this in a hind limb unloading study. And you can see that the muscle is bigger in the lambs treated animals. Um, this is a shift to the right, so they have a higher proportion of larger fibers, as well as they are stronger. The bone is also less, uh, is less porous, it's stronger in the lambs treated. They, they think that this is, oh, I, th so the name lambs comes from this, uh, they combine locomotor, because they want to use it as an exercise mimetic, with the amino uh, dazole as uh, the, the chemical compound. So they call it locomidazole, also known as lambs. It's thought to, have a really high impact on mitochondria, and so that was one of the reasons why we chose it, because it can increase PGC1-alpha, and then hopefully downstream uh, uh, beta oxidation. 
So we, are current, we did a pilot study, and it's also we're finishing this study with um, uh, internal funding from an RSFG, where we two times uh, daily injections of subcutaneous for, the, uh, for these lambs animals from 27 to 33 weeks. Again, that's sort of mid-stage to end-stage renal disease. We're looking at muscle strength, fatigue, and size, as well as bone quality and quantity. Um, the exciting thing from this is that LAMS actually worked in our model. So, you know, one thing we want to be able to optimize exercise. The other thing is for people that can exercise, what can we do to help those folks? And so we can see from, um, this is muscle strength, so electrically stimulated torque, there's a reduction in CKD, normalization with LAMS. When we look at muscle fatigue, muscle fatigue normal here, CKD is in the red. LAMS actually had this potentiation here, but it actually uh, is consistent with the normal. From a bone perspective, it reduced cortical porosity, it increased cortical thickness, and we look at osteoclast activity, which is that bone resorption, it's reduced in CKD, which is a good thing. So we're showing a lot of beneficial effects in just a small pilot study, and we're hoping that the full study from the RSFG will be able to uh, mirror that. So right now we have to complete the study with two different doses. Getting this high dose was a little bit finicky. We had some issues, but I think this is gonna be the appropriate one. We're also uh, currently completing pharmacokinetic studies to look at dosing, if that needs to change, if we can go to one time per day versus two. So those are the things that we're doing from a drug perspective. Um, so if we have evidence for exercise that there's some beneficial effect, I can't say that it's overwhelming. I can't say that it really warms my heart to say I can guarantee we're gonna have this plethora of effects. What can we do from a clinical management standpoint for people that have chronic kidney disease? Because right now it's not common practice for people with kidney disease um, to come to physical therapy. It's really, there's no sort of uh, common community programs that are out there for um, gym-based programs. So anyone in this room right now, we don't have that sort of connection. So some of the stuff that I do with the Academy for Geriatric Physical Therapy is developing some of these clinical practice guidelines. And so um, what I've done is I've done different ones for osteoporosis. Um, some of these are, have been developed by other folks. And so what we're doing here, uh, and this is, again, Ashley's working on this with me, but we're trying to do a knowledge translation paper to better direct clinical care for those folks that have cl uh, chronic kidney disease. So even though they, we don't have specific directions on how to appropriately manage them, we're looking at the symptoms and the clinical practice guidelines that exist to be able to then um, hopefully change clinical practice. So if people recognize that these deficits exist and that PT can have an impact, well maybe then we'll start actually seeing them um, clinically. So when we look at physical activity, um, the main thing is that folks with CKD are not physically active. 44% of patients on hemodialysis don't perform physical activity. For those that do, it's about nine days per, per month. That should be nine days per month, not week. Obviously, they're not having superhuman powers. Uh, and so they're just not very active. Um, when you look at low activity, poor health-related quality of life, depression, increased mortality, those are all things that are hard to study from a basic science standpoint. We really can't look at that in our animals, um, but it does have consequence. One consequence of maybe, or one reason why people with kidney disease are not um, being physically active is that a survey found that less than 40% of nephrologists talk about or assess physical activity. Less than 5% of those actually perform it or give any kind of handout or any information to their patients. Um, and it's partly because they just don't know the direction. I mean, PTs don't really know the direction as well. And so that's why some of these knowledge translation documents to really synthesize what information is out there and how you can better direct these patients are really needed. When you look at physical activity and mobility and transplant, it's even more important. When you look at transplant from a renal perspective versus liver, if you're frail and you need a liver transplant, you're prioritized to that list. So you can get your liver transplant. For renal, it's the opposite. If you're frail, you're less likely to receive a transplant, you're more likely to be delisted, you're more likely to be added to the wait list or have longer wait times. So they're putting the, uh, the patients uh, it's kind of like getting a test without ever being lectured to, right? So we're not giving them the opportunity to try to improve their physical function, but we're using that as an outcome to determine whether or not they're going to get the renal transplant. When you look at from a physical health standpoint, for every 0.1 meter per second reduced, 
there's a 26% greater risk of death. So that whole gate speed thing is just not inconsequential. It has importance, it has value. Um, and so we really need to be able to improve the activity levels of these folks on transplant. So physical activity overall is generally safe. Um, I can't say that, uh, you know, there are, in my study we showed some detrimental effects, but I would say it's not consistently found. Those with CKD are generally not active. Uh, I didn't present this just for obviously time, but the barriers research that's been done, it's just not effective because if it was, we'd actually have increased adherence and compliance to those with CKD for physical activity or exercise. So you see these two fellows in the bottom here and we have uh, Colin and Zachary. They are both helping with this community engaged project. Um, and so this is currently a grant that's in review again for, this is a big month, right? So we'll see what happens, what I'm gonna be doing for the next year based upon this stuff. Um, but it's a foundation grant through Dialysis Clinics Inc. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to get a better understanding of cultural perspectives that may be influencing abilities uh, or desires for people to participate in physical activity or exercise programs. Um, the other thing is when somebody has chronic kidney disease, um, particularly there was a study that came out where black Americans, uh, they are six times more likely to have chronic kidney disease if a family member has chronic kidney disease but they don't see themselves as being more vulnerable to getting it. And so when you look at some of the studies out there, physical activity, there's a lot of data that shows the more physically active you are, the less likely you are to have chronic kidney disease. So this study, we're not only trying to address the people with kidney disease, how to get them more active, but we wanna to get to their family members so that we can beat them to the punch. So we can get them more active now before they actually have or at risk for having kidney disease. So we're trying to span the, the kind of the, the science continuum of optimizing exercise, trying to get the word of exercise out, and then trying to figure out how to get people to do it, because either you love it or you hate it. You know, you only stay in the middle for so long. Um, so from a basic translational science standpoint, CKD leads to poorer bone quality and quantity, weaker muscle strength, impaired running capacity, and maybe muscle atrophy. Physical activity and exercise can increase running capacity, but it's not really clear as to whether or not it improves muscle strength or fatigue. Um, exercise adaptation may be limited due to the metabolic disturbances, and so we're gonna try to overcome that through either HIIT training or through that LAMS drug intervention. From a translation to practice perspective, um, really we're trying to use existing literature to develop clinical practice guidelines to be able to direct proper care and clinical management. And so again, it doesn't specifically exist for chronic kidney disease, but we're using the symptoms that they experience to guide the care. And then understanding from a community perspective, it's not just about once we get this optimal dose of exercise, how do you get people to do it? Because they always, you know, they're kind of looking for a pill, right? They, they don't want to go out and do it themselves. So we're trying to get it from both perspectives, that exercise pill, as well as optimizing it. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time.